The Human Experiment by Dr. David Carmichael, ch Chapter 10, Cultural Evolution in Modern Humans. In previous chapters, we have focused mainly on the physical, philosophical arguments and genetic and fossil evidence for human and bio, human biological evolution. However, in the period since the evolution of fully modern humans, most of the changes in our species have been the result of cultural evolution. The beginnings of agriculture, the expansion of human in, humans into the new world, the rise and fall of civilizations, all of these developments are, and more were accomplished only after humans became fully modern. It is so, the so, these sorts of changes and the ar archaeological evidence for them that we, sh we will examine during the latter parts of the book. The human species is a product of both biological and cultural evolution, but biological changes played a more prominent role in the early evolution of humans. While cultural changes have dominated the more recent developments that characterize our species, Question answer, how is it possible to know where and how prehistoric people lived? The cultural changes in human life ways are documented almost entirely by the material byproducts of human behavior that compromise the archeological record. Culture as a human adaptation. Culture can be defined as the complete set of knowledge, belief, and rules of behavior that are learned by members of a society. Tyler, 1871. Culture is also our extra somatic means of adaptation. In other words, culture exists outside of or beyond the body. It is intellectual ra rather than biological, and it is the way we make sense of the interface of and interface with the physical and social environments within which we live. It is the primary means for non-genetic adaptation. Ashmore and Shar, 2010, 18. The material byproducts of hominin behavior reflect culture at some level and some archaic human populations, especially Neanderthals, even generated rock art but it is during the Upper Paleolithic period that archaeologists see a significant increase in artwork and other activities that seem to indicate the leap, a leap forward in the complexity of human culture. There are sites in South Africa that have yielded Upper Paleolithic style stone tools and perhaps representation, repre representational art dating as far back as 70,000 years. In Europe, this culture evolution occurred about 40,000 years ago. Randall White, 1982-1993, <clears throat> has identified a series of eight major behavioral developments that are evident in the late Paleolithic period. A brief consideration of just a few of these cultural innovations is su sufficient to illustrate the degree to which material remains can help us identify cultural behaviors that change the ways modern humans adapt. Manufacture of non-utilitarian non objects. Non-utilitarian objects or artifacts are those that don't serve any obvious necessary practical functions. They include such things as jewelry, body art, and tools that are unnecessary necessarily fancy or too fragile to actually be used. Non-utilitarian objects are generally inferred to have had symbolic meanings rather than practical value. So for example, personal adornment like tattoos might serve to identify an individual, communicate their role in society, or document their relationship to a particular social group. Jewelry may indicate social status, the ac accumulation of wealth, or participation in a social network that provides access to high value resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. Movement of raw materials over long distances. The movement of raw materials from a distance source 
to a place where tools from those materials are manufactured, used and discarded indicates several sorts of sophisticated thinking. The fact that a certain raw material was recognized as appropriate and preferred for a particular task and that it was collected and brought to a location where the raw material doesn't occur naturally indicates an awareness of spatial distributions. It also reflects the ability to plan ahead and take the raw material to the places where it will be used in the future. Gaining access to the raw material suggests that people involved had social relationships with the intervening groups that would allow for visiting the raw material source or trading for the raw material. Elaborate burials containing grave goods. Burials with grave goods are generally taken as an indication of a sense of belonging to a social group and the care that is given to a deceased member of the group. Grave goods also imply that people recognize that certain people, personal items, belong to the deceased or part of the person's identity. The inclusion of grave goods might also reflect a belief in an afterlife, where such things as weapons and containers might be needed by the deceased, either in the afterlife or during the deceased journey to the spirit world. Production works of art. It is likely that much of or most of the most artwork is for a form of symbolic communication. Finding prehistoric art means that someone felt it was important to take the time to create it. It is reasonable to expect that there was a cultural reason to create the art and a reason that it was produced or deposited on a, in a particular location. For example, many examples of rock art occur in caves and that is often taken to indicate the artist had a sense of entering the underworld. Producing the art was part of a spiritual journey. Other des designs depicting hunting scenes might commemorating past hunts or might be attempts to capture the, the animal spirit so as to be successful in upcoming hunts. In any event, the production of art is presumed to have intellectual meaning to those who create it. Of course, it is impossible to directly observe the behavior of humans who lived in prehistoric times, so it is necessary to make inference, inferences about their behavior from the, mat, from the material culture they left behind. Archaeological sites usually do not contain fossils because most sites are too young for fossilization to have occurred during the time since they were deposited. So rather than yielding fossils, most archeological sites are made up of artifacts, features, and echofacts. Artifacts are any portable item that has been manufactured, used, modified, or moved by humans. They include things as mundane as waste flakes generated during the manufacture of stone tools and pebbles picked up and used as hammer stones, as well as items such as food remains, milling stones, elaborate jewelry, ceramic vessels, glass bottles, and papyrus scrolls. Features are also made by humans, but they are things that may be thought of as fixtures or facilities facilities within a site, which are not usually portable. Examples include things, include such things as building walls, campfires, irrigation canals, pyramids, and rock art. Echo facts are natural materials that are recovered within archeological sites that are indicative of things such as the depositional conditions that are produced the soil layers, insects that may indicate the season the site was occupied, and pollen that provides information on the vegetation at the site during the time of occupation. All of these contents of archaeological sites and the relationship among the sites themselves are used to make inferences 
about the behaviors that produced the material remains. Artifacts and technology. Most people pr probably give little or no thought to stone manufacture. Nevertheless, stone technology is important for understanding our past because it re represents a huge part of the archaeological record. Stone tools and byproducts of their manufacture are virtually ubiquitous on archaeological sites from most time periods, including well into the Neolithic. The earliest stone tools date back to 3.3 million years ago, years ago, and are believed to have been made by the Australopithecus remedis. The earliest stone tools made by members of gen genus Homo ant were the Alduin tools made by the Homo habilis about 2.4 million years ago. The oldest pottery vessels seem to be those made by the Jamoan culture in Japan about 12,000 years ago. That means that 99.5% of the archaeological record of tool use consists almost entirely of stone tools and some of the bones on which they were used. If we were able to if we were to understand much ab at all about human cultural behavior prior to the past 12,000 years, we need to pay attention to stone tools and the byproducts of their manufacture. Lithic artifacts, stone tools, and their byproducts are useful indicators of human behavior for several reasons. First, they are essentially non-perishable. It is logical to assume that early humans were using either kinds of materials such as plants and animal hides, but those types of organics do not preserve readily for the archaeological record. In addition, stone tool manufacturing is a re reductive technology. Most of the tools today used today are built with additive technologies. That is, several kinds of materials are combined or assembled to make the final tool. Reductive technologies work differently and are less common today in ancient times. In making a stone tool, such as a spear point, one chips away all the stone material that is not a spear point. Conceptually, this is something like a sculptor chipping away all the marble that is not, of the, not the image of the Venus de Milo. Without the benefit of a chisel, instead, stone tools are manufactured used by using hammers made of stone, bone, antler, or hardwood to remove material from a core or chunk of raw material. The chipping away or flaking, aka flint napping, is actually fairly complicated. One cannot simply smash two rocks together and obtain a useful tool. Even when making Making a relatively simple tool, such as an Oldowan pebble tool, figure 10.1, one must control the amount of force to applied to the stone, the angle at which the force is applied, and the precise location of, on the rock to which the force is applied, and the same, must, the same thing must be done. In the proper sequence for each chip removed from raw material, in the case of an artifact, like an, an early hand axe made by Homo erectus, a single tool requires a systematic removal of hundreds or even thousands of chips or flakes. Figure 10.2. I, I constantly marvel that our prehistoric ancestors figured out the physical physics of sending force through vicious solid in modern scientific terms, which is the way chipping acts on crypt, cryptocrystalline rocks, such as flint and volcanic glass. Here's a picture. I'm sorry. This is the Odwalla pebble tool replica showing the simple design with only a few flakes removed from the smooth pebble. Lower abovelian hand axe. 
replica showing the, that flakes have been removed from an entire hand tire tool reshaping the stone and producing multiple working edges in the process. Another important aspect of flint napping is as a reductive technology is that flaking produces byproducts each stage of tool manufacture. These byproducts are mostly discarded but they can be used to infer what parts of the manufacture sequence took place at which locations as well as telling us what specifically the tool maker was trying to do at each step along the way, an extent that we can identify and distinguish different sources of raw material, we can often determine where different parts of the manufacturing sequence took place. Consider the following example. I've had the good fortune to be able to analyze an artifact collection from the Fillmore Pass site, a 10,000 year old campsite at Fort Bliss, Texas. The collection contains several dozen fulsome points along with a number of per performs representing the early earlier stages in the spear point manufacturing sequence. Although all the performs were made of chert from local source sources in the Franklin Mountains, none of them completed fulsom points were of those materials. All of the finished points were made of materials from other parts of the Southwest, some from as far away as Amarillo, Texas, and they were all broken during use. Uh, during use. What can we infer from this pattern is that Folsom points were made, being made at the Fillmore Pass site using local materials, but many attempts were unsuccessful and the broken performs were discarded in the site, on the site. Any completed points made by, by of Franklin Mountain Church were carried away to be used and were eventually broken and discarded somewhere else. The completed points were discarded at Fillmore Pass consist entirely oh, Jesus. Sorry, points made elsewhere. They were broken during the use during use and replaced with new points at the Fillmore Pass site or Fillmore Pass site. And the discarded bases have leave a record of the distant raw materials sources that were used by the site's occupants. Some of the raw materials are very distinctive, so it has been possible to show the site's occupants traveled at least 250 miles to the north and east El Paso. So even if tools look really, really crude, like some of the older one to tools made by the H. Habilis, we can be confident that they reflect human activity when they occur miles away from the source of raw materials from which they were made. Remember the lengthy discussion in chapter three regarding the interpretation of indirect evidence? It's very relevant to the study of stone tool manufacture. Aside from the things we can infer from the technological details of manufacturing process, we can make inferences about cultural change if we compare the tools from, a diff from different time periods. It is possible to see some general trends in biological and cultural change. Table 10.1, the simplest technology, figure 10.1, increasingly more sophisticated tools are invented by successfully more evolved species. The tools created by Homo erectus populations are often assigned to the Achillean tradition, ten, ten, uh, figure 10.3, require more control and planning to execute. The hand axe, for example, requires the removal of hundreds of flakes in order to in flakes in a particular sequence in order to thin and shape the tool into its final form. It also requires the toolmaker to have an idea 
of what the final form is before starting the manufacturing process and the ability to plan how to move through the steps needed to reach the final form. This is a level of sophistication not evidenced by the earliest stone tools. This is figure 10.1. That's the tool technology. Here's 10.3. This is the Achillean hand axe note, the refined shape flake scars indicating large number of flake removals needed to thin the shape of the tool. As impressive as, a, <laughs> As impressive as a eight, Achillean hand axe in some ways is not very it is not a very efficient tool. It could have been used for a few different tasks, <clears throat> but it is heavy, bulky and heavy, and the working edges are very similar, limiting the number of functions. Additionally, the fun the production of of a single tool requires a large piece of raw material, which yields only a single tool. A single tool, like tool manufacturing techniques such as the Levallois core method developed by Neanderthals, are more efficient. Figure 10.4. In the Levallois technique, the napper produces a conical core of a more or less more or less standardized shape, size, and shape. The top or widest part of the core is shaped so that a blow struck on the side will remove a wide flat flake, a predictable size, which is then further modified into various sorts of tools, figure 10.5. The core can be reshaped and used to generate a whole series of levellous flakes of similar size and shape, making more efficient use of the available raw materials the flakes can be modified into a very variety of tools for carrying out tasks that require a variety of shapes, types of working edges, etc. So even as far back as the Neanderthal times, we see evidence for increasing efficiency in manufacture and diversification of tool function. The patterns continue and are intensified by Homo sapiens populations living during the Upper Paleolithic period. Here's the replica of the Levaeus and corresponding flakes. The core has a groove, a flake scar running from left to right. The scar shows where the corresponding flake is removed. This is figure 10.5. Replica of the mountain back knife and side scraper. Over time, the number of regional variants of tool techniques increases, as does the number of different kinds of tools with the maximum range of complexity being developed by modern humans during the Upper Paleolithic period. With the invention of prismatic blade technology, figure 10.6, the technique used to produce prismatic blades involves the use of, direct, of indirect percussion on a prepared core, that is an antler, bone, or wood punch is held on a specifically prepared spot on the core, and then the punch, and when the punch is struck by a hammer, the force is directed down the core on, in a precise alignment with the ridges on the core. The results is the production of long, thin blades that are triangular in cross section and taper to razor sharp edge along both sides. By moving from ridge to ridge around the core, many blades can be detached from a single core and the length of cutting edges produced far exceeds what could be made with earlier techniques. However, not only did the prepared blade technology utilize raw materials efficiently, it also permitted upper paleolithic peoples to make a wide variety of tools with specialized functional edges and forms, figure 10.7. This is 10.6, and replicas of the upper Paleolithic left to right. Late in the upper Paleolithic period, Homo sapiens tool making invented 
another kind of technology involving the use of soft hammer percussion. In this technique, cores are struck with hammers made of strong of antler, bone, or wood. Soft hammer hammers apply force to the stone differently, causing the removal of thin, broad, flat flakes from the surface of the core and resulting in the thinning of core or biface in the process. <coughs> Excuse me. In the process, the core can be chipped into very thin and sharp projectile points and knives, some of the best known examples of which were pro produced by Sultrian groups in Europe during the late and upper Paleolithic period. Some of the solatine bifaces are so well made and fragile that they may have functioned as art or ceremonial items with Taker 1994-33. But, but soft percussion biface technology is very functional and efficient in several ways. Bifaces such as the larger ones in 10.8 could be manufactured at raw material source areas thus removing the weathered outer surface of the stone and making them more portable. Large, very sharp flakes can be removed from the core as needed. As something of a prehistoric Swiss army knife, eventually after the removal of many flakes for tools, it would be, still be possible to produce a spear point or knife that was the ultimate objective of the biface technology. And when a knife or point is broken, a biface is easier to resharpen than a blade tool of a different sort of efficiency, but efficient it nonetheless. Following the Upper Paleolithic <clears throat> in many parts of the world, another change in stone tool Technology is evidence a shift toward smaller tools made by a technique called pressure flaking. Pressure flaking involves pressuring a flaking tool, such as an antler tip, against the edge of a stone and pushing to remove a flake. The removal of a pressure flake involves less force and produces smaller flakes that does percussion flaking. But that is part of the advantage of the technique. Pressure flaking is used to make very small or very finely finished edges on tools, figure 10.9. That would not be possible with the per percussion flaking. The shift to small tools was probably influenced by several factors, but those influence likely, influences likely included a change the size of the game animals being hunted the range at which they were hunted, and the increasing scarcity of high-quality stone raw tool raw materials. Thus, pressure flaking is often used to make tools out of very small pieces of raw materials, especially where high-quality stone, such as obsidian and chert, is scarce in the local environment. This is another example of a different sort of technology efficiency. Small projectile points of obsidian chert and chert made by pressures, pressure flaking length of specimen at lower right is 1.9 centimeters. The long-term patterns reflected in stone technology indicate that tool manufacture has become more efficient and specialized over time. This shouldn't be very surprising as we are still witnessing an intensification and speeding up of that pattern. The rates of change in innovation has increased markedly through time with our computers that have become obsolete in a few years and phones that people want to replace nearly every year. We are still living out the generation, the general pattern that began millions of years ago. Not only does <clears throat> our technology change ever more rapidly, but the changes include proliferation in the variety of tool type, many of them specialized for very specific tasks. 
In contrast to stone tool manufacture, ceramic technology or the production of pottery is an additive technology. In most cases, prehistoric pottery manufacture involves a collection and processing of clay and the addition of non-plastic tempering materials such as grass, crushed shell, crushed pottery, crushed rock, or sand. The temper is a mixture in with the clay to prevent shrinkage and cracking during firing. The firing may or may not involve the use of formal of a formal kiln feature that would be recognized as such within an archaeological site. Although not as impervious as stone artifacts, ceramic vessels or at least fragments of broken vessels known as sherds are readily preserved and common parts of the artifact collections from many sites. Due to their common occurrence and the tendency for humans to decorate their pottery, both complete vessels and fragmenta fragmentary shards may yield a variety of kinds of information about the people who made them. The form and the details of manufacturing techniques may indicate where the pottery was made, how old it is, and what it was used for. Chemical analysis of clay, temper, and paint may provide information on where those raw materials were obtained and the, by extension on how far they were moved across the landscape before the pottery was broken or discarded. Residues on the interior of vessels may reveal what we, was cooked or stored in the vessels. The occurrence of non-local non pottery styles on sites help define the trade relationships um, among groups living in different regions and the painted designs often depicting depict animals or aspects of nature that are important in a group's ideology. In southern New Mexico and west Texas, the earliest pottery dates to about AD 250. The vessels are made of clay that fires known, fires, I'm sorry, fires brown, thus brown wares, and most are undecorated or minimally embellished utility were, were used for cooking and storage, figure 1010. In some regions, such as the Membres River drainage, later populations made pottery that was much more elaborate such as bowls illustrated in figure 10.11. Vessels with extensive decorative designs such as these were often not used for domestic functions, but in, interred with the deceased as burial goods. The designs are highly stylized depictions of subjects like wind, water, insects, feathers, etc. And sometimes they were purposely broken after being placed in the grave, figure 1011, bowl on the right, thus an entirely different level of abstract or eccentric, eccentric meaning is embodied in those vessels. This is the brownware of New Mexico, and then this is the late style, the black and white pottery. The vessels in figure 1012 all come from northern Chihuahua, Mexico, within the region often referred to as the Casas Grandes Interaction sp Sphere, but they were made at different sites, Pegimi, Carrots, and Via Ahumanda, that served as regional centers within the larger regional socio-political system. Interestingly, one of them is an example of an effigy pot, a vessel that is constructed in the form of, the, of a macaw. Such vessels have sometimes been interpreted as having spirit, special spiritual meaning in the context of sh shamanic practices. Even more recent ceramics may be of interest to archaeologists such as those working in on historic period sites beneath downtown El Paso 
lies the remains of an extensive historic occupation of overseas China, a neighborhood that was established by and for laborers who built the Southern Pacific Railroad. From California to El Paso in 1881, in much of downtown El Paso, the buildings lack basements and elevators, so, as, so there is often good preservation of sediments, building remnants, and artifacts buried under the modern city. Although there has been relatively little excavation of the Chinese community, test excavations have yielded a wide variety of well-preserved artifacts, including many pieces of pottery that were shaped shipped directly from mainland China. Stosky ETL, 1985. The collection includes such items as ginger jars, soy sauce jars, rice bowls, spoons, and medicine bottles, all of, uh, of which reflect a concentrated, concerted effort on the part of the overseas Chinese, Chinese to maintain contacts with their home cultures in China. Just as there is a record of changing technology recorded in the artifacts contained in a site, so too do the features provide evidence of cultural change. Figure 10.14 shows a prehistoric pit house in the final stages of excavation. Although it measures about four meters in diameter and a meter deep involving significant labor const to construct, such dwellings are generally associated with populations who drive the majority of the subsistence can't say that word from hunting and gathering the semi-subterranean construction take advantage of the thermal properties of the soil layers suggesting that it is probably a fall and winter season residence Storage pits around the outside and under the floor support the idea that the village was occupied for weeks or months. In much of the southwest, southwestern United States, the shift to above ground structures occurred about AD 1100, figure 10.15, shows a small area of stabilized wall remnants in the, in the much larger Pueblo con complex. At Pecos Pueblo National Monument, a few miles east of Santa Fe, New Mexico, dating to about A.D. 1300 to 1400, these features indicate a community organization that is larger and more complex than that of a pit house village. There are many more rooms, but they are smaller, and perhaps half of them are for storage of agricultural pr produce. Neighboring families share walls and relatively large numbers of people live in close proximity. This implies <clears throat> the existence of social mechanisms that serve to ameliorate interpersonal stress and unite community members for the purpose of construction projects and other community-wide activities the reconstructed kiva or ceremonial chamber in 10.16 is visual evidence of ritual activities that would help serve to foster intercommunity cooperation. The stabilized, that's the Pecos Pueblo, and that's also the Pecos Pueblo. In other areas of the Southwest, we see architecture that suggests the sites were constructed in defensive settings in response to regional stress and competition of, over natural resources. The ruins in the Gia Cliff Dwellings National Monument, figure 10.17, were built in the late 1200s AD. They were occupied for only about 20 years during a time of environmental instability and population movement. One can imagine the challenge of collecting and shaping the rocks, carrying the stones up into the caves, and building irregularly shaped masonry masonry rooms that fit to fit that unique location. The difficulties inherent in this sort of construction effort supports the idea that regional unrest 
was an important factor in choosing to live in a defendable location despite the logistical challenges of construction. That's the Gia cliff dwellings. Imparting meaning to the landscape. Many of us may not give much thought to the nature of art or what it might say about our species. Of course, examples of art wall art are all around us every day. And even if we notice it, we may still take it for granted for that very reason. Because we've always known art and its ever presence, art is such a basic part of our daily lives that it's hard to imagine life without art. And that's really the point. Art is a basic trait of modern humans. The ability to make and interpret art is so basic to the human condition that it can be considered part of the psychic unity of humankind. What that means is that all biologi biologically modern humans have the same basic needs, desires, abilities, and thought processes, even the, though prehistoric populations didn't drive cars or use computers, we can still identify them as fully modern by the use of their artwork. Not only did prehistoric people make designs, but the design held meaning, and some of the images were used in ways that we still use imagery today. Artwork is not simply about making pleasing designs. It, it is about symbolic communication. Let's consider some examples of how indigenous people communicate through artwork and how these, those examples relate to the archaeological record. One of the most well-known and accessible sorts of art in the archaeological record is rock art. Even though many people have seen or at least know about the existence of rock art, a surprising number of people have misunderstandings about the nature of designs and the significance of places where they were created. There is a place I sometimes go fishing on the Mescalero Apache Reservation in southern New Mexico. Once while obtaining my tribal fishing permit, I overheard a local Indian rancher commenting on the photographs of local rock art designs displayed in the office. I was amazed to hear him say that the rock art was no big deal, dismissing the designs as a bunch of old Indian graffiti. I could understand that he might have had have a political reason for resenting the presence of Native Americans on land he would like to control, but he was not only angry, <clears throat> excuse me, he was simply ignorant about Native American rock art styles. They are not graffiti. Rock art sites are profoundly sacred places to all the Native American groups with whom I've worked. For example, consider the rock art panel illustrated in figure 10.18. The design is near my summer archeological field school site in Southern New Mexico. It is part of a collection of more than 21,000 petroglyphs at the Three Rivers site during and 1999. When I first saw this particular panel, I was in the company of the governor of the Tigura, Tigua tribe of the Osleta del Sur Pueblo. The designs extend an impressive 15 feet up the imposing basalt column we looked up, stopped in our tracks, and were transfixed by the power of the image. My companion was speechless for a moment, and then he exhaled slowly and said, There is the whole world, the entire cosmos of my people. It was the first time he had seen that particular prehistoric rock panel. <clears throat> but the images are the same. Uh, as those still used by his people today. There is a corn plant growing out of the crack of a crack in the rock at the basin of the design. The ears of maize, the substance, sorry, the substance 
I'm so sorry. The substance base of the Pueblo peoples are clearly <clears throat> indicated at the joints of the stalk. The top of the plant reaches up to the image of the cloud, the details of which include rain coming off the bottom, the arc of the rainbow curving over the, a lightning bolt, and wisps of clouds extending into the sky above the step design. There is a thunderbird perched atop the cloud, and above it all are the eyes of the one who watches. The entire panel relates to the connection of earth and sky, the water cycle, fertility, renewal, and the place of the Pueblo peoples in the universe. The image is a metaphor of the tribe's authority to exist as a people and for their belonging to that part of the landscape. That is not graffiti or even merely an outdoor art gallery. It is a place to teach and remind people who they are and what their priorities should be, living in harmony and balance with nature. These holy sites also serve as a mnemonic devices for groups who lack a writing system and who know about the past through oral history. Sacred sites like these are places of power. Here's a close-up of the petroglyphs. The concept of power is difficult to express in English. Power is a spiritual energy or life force that enables an individual to interact with force, the forces of nature and supernatural worlds. Supernatural power derives from a variety of plants, animals, and metallurgical phenomena. Once obtained, power gives at one the ability to influence certain aspects of nature by virtue of special relationship with the spirits responsible for them. Different kinds and degrees of power may be bestowed on different individuals depending on which spirits are involved. Power is accepted and use, used on behalf of the entire tribe are more potent than those used by individuals for the benefit of their family, such as healing ceremonies, Powerful places are locations where spiritual power is received or where it, it's used. Its use is needed for protection from spiritual danger. Carmichael, 1998, page 91. In my ethnographic research on sacred sites, I have classified powerful places into three different sorts of sites, natural sites, natural areas of intersection, places of transformation, and resource areas. The physical and spirit worlds intersect are at several kinds of places. Among the most important of these are sacred mountains. There are several sacred mountain peaks within the traditional range of the Muscularia Apaches. Not only do these peaks define the graphical geographical core of their territory, but they are also important in tribal cosmology. The mountain peaks correspond to the function, foundational teepee poles that make up the Holy Lodge used in their most sacred ceremonies. The Holy Lodge and its support post correspond in turn to the mountains which hold up the teepee cover that is the sky because the mountain peaks is where the earth touches the sky it is a place of intersection and axis of spiritual power in the fabric of cosmos sierra blanca is a sacred place because it touches the sky and has been a source of spiritual power it has also been the focus of, of many ceremonial activities over the generations, and it becomes more sacred with each additional religious observance. The entire mountain is a sacred landscape, even though there is almost nothing man-made to be found there. Other such places include caves, where it is possible to enter the earth, the spirit dimension and springs where the water has just issued forth from that spiritual dimension. 
Another major category of sacred sites consists of places of transformation where journeys to the spirit world are undertaken. The most sacred of these burial are burials at death. Individuals are transformed and their spirits make a four day journey back to the spiritual world. Funeral rites are intended to expedite the journey and prevent the spirits of the deceased from attempting to stay in this physical dimension. The sweat lodge is another kind of transformation site as we as are places where the shamans make contact with the spirit world. In many indigenous societies, shamans use prayer, divination, and healing to attend to the needs of their people. In each of these activities, the shaman can make a ritual transformation, traveling to the spirit dimension to obtain assistance in making diagnosis, etc. Figure 1020 is an example of the directional shrine associated with a prehistoric Pueblo village site in northern New Mexico. We know about the use of these features because they are still in use contemporary Puebla, Puebloan peoples. This feature measures only about one meter to about 0.5 meters and consists of of an arrangement of four rocks, but it is as a it is as sacred as the altar in a Christian church. Let me zoom out on that. I'm sorry. Directional shrine of an ancestor of Pueblo. Another transformation place is shown below in Figure ten point two one. This cluster of rock art designs of the Three Rivers Petroglyph site includes a rare depiction of full anthropomorphic figures. At the left of center of the photograph, the figure is bent over in a posture that has been interpreted as representing the feelings experienced during shaman, shamanic tr traces, trances. The figure is grimacing, showing teeth and wearing a feathered headdress or hair ornament. It is likely that this panel is describing and or commemorating a ritual transformation experienced by a shaman who's, who chose the site because of its spiritual power. That was on the right. Sorry, <laughs> I'm seeing if on the left center. Oh, there it is. Okay. Figure 10.2, Places of Ritual Transformation, Three Rivers, Petroglyphotero County in New Mexico. When such places become in, in, imbued with a sacred power, they become memorable. They become part of the way we experience and remember the details of the, lands, of the landscape, how we connect to and know the land, Ton 1977, especially for preliterate pre cultures, knowing the earth in this way through the sacred details and the stories that accompany artwork, allow people to remember an enormous amount of detailed details and the stories that accompany the artwork allowed people to remember an enormous amount of detailed details and the stories are coming on detailed knowledge that would help them survive and adapt being able to walk across 20 miles of open desert and go right to the only spring in the area be facilitated by naming and imparting meaning to the mountains and the landscape through art the art is symbolic communication instrumental to the survival of our ancestors and characteristics of our species as a whole. This is the end of chapter 10.